Hi guys, and welcome to this virtual lecture course in Classical Mechanics and Special Relativity. My name is Dr Andrew Mitchell, and in this lecture course we'll be discussing some of the most profound and deep theories in the whole of physics. These theories are fundamental, they intersect with every other aspect of physics. They are deep, they are interesting, they allow us to view the world as it really is in the deepest way. Although we won't be touching uh, explicitly on quantum mechanics, the theories that we'll develop here, we will see, can actually be very easily generalised and carried over into the quantum world. Although we won't be discussing electromagnetism explicitly, the work we develop on uh, special relativity will allow us to understand electromagnetism. The uh, physics that we'll discuss in the first part is due to Isaac Newton, developed in the 1600s. This might seem like totally prehistoric stuff, but this mechanics really describes a lot of the world around us. As long as we're not moving too quickly, as long as the masses we're considering are not too massive, as long as we're not on the nanoscale, then this classical mechanics developed by Newton is the right theory. The problem is, it can become very, very difficult to apply this theory and really solve real world problems. The way Newton devised it, it just becomes very complicated and cumbersome and you might think this is a, a trivial thing that's just a, a bit of difficulty in calculation, but it actually really stops us um, doing real calculations in the end. And furthermore, we can gain deeper insights by reformulating the problem. The way we'll do this in the first part of the lecture course is actually by developing an even more profound and even more fundamental principle. It's called the principle of least action. This principle, when applied to classical mechanics, will allow us to develop equations of motion that reduce to Newton's equations of motion, but put it on a much more general footing. This is the so-called Lagrangian formulation, and we'll also look at the Hamiltonian formulation, which is then something that carries over neatly to quantum mechanics. So these formulations are the way in which we're going to discuss classical mechanics. Um, we're also going to discuss constraints and symmetries, phase space, configuration space, there's many, many interesting things that we're going to discuss in this first part of the course. And as I say, the beauty of it is it really solves real world problems. In the second part of the course, we're going to be t talking about special relativity as developed by Einstein in 1905. This is a beautifully deep and interesting subject. It really changes the way we think about the world and the physical reality itself. Our concepts of space and time are totally changed. The equivalence of mass and energy equals mc squared. All of this good stuff we're going to be talking about in the second part of the course. Importantly, we're going to develop the, the rigorous mathematical formulation of special relativity in terms of so-called four vectors, and we're going to be able to apply this to all sorts of interesting problems in particle physics and astronomy and all sorts of things. That's going to come in the second part, but we're really going to rely heavily on the machinery that we develop in the first part of the course for this. So that's why these two topics are combined into this module. So in the first lecture, which is coming up in a few moments' time, uh, we're just going to remind ourselves of the old-fashioned way of doing mechanics. The mechanics due to Newton, Newton's laws, how you go about solving those problems. And with that recap, we'll already see some of the limitations of the Newtonian formulation and the need to go beyond it. That's what we're going to do in this course. I hope you enjoy it. It's one of the most fascinating and deep courses, I think, in all of physics. So let's get down to work. I'd like to give a short introduction and synopsis to this course, the structure of the course, and the kinds of things that we're going to be talking about. The course will consider two related topics, classical mechanics and special relativity. We're going to do classical mechanics in the first half, and special relativity in the second half. However, there's going to be many connections between the two. And in particular, when we're talking about special relativity in the second half of the course, we're going to be using a lot of the machinery and the framework that we've set out in the first part. So let me introduce some of the main figures. Uh, roughly in order of historical uh, appearance, we have Galileo in the 1500s. We'll be talking about his idea of relativity. Uh, then moving on to Newton in the 1600s, who of course made massive contributions to physics and also invented a whole areas of maths in order to be able to treat that kind of physics, we'll be discussing his, uh, his classical mechanics. The classical mechanics we'll be discussing in the first half will be the classical mechanics of Newton, 
However, the framework in which we'll discuss it will be in the context of the contributions made by Lagrange and Hamilton in the 17 and 1800s. Um, they really reformulated the, the problem and allowed it to be generalized into a much more powerful framework to uh, allow us to really tackle a richer range of much more complicated problems. So the mechanics itself will be that of Newton. Um, the physics will be Newtonian mechanics. Uh, yet we will put it in a different framework, and that's going to be really the content of the first part of the course. The second part of the course will focus on uh, special relativity, of course, made famous and invented by Einstein in the, uh, the early 1900s, essentially. And he was building upon a lot of work of other people. He wasn't just uh, working in isolation. And one of the, the main figures that we'll be discussing uh, was Lorentz. Pictured on the right-hand side here is Emmy Nota. She was uh, a, a brilliant f mathematical physicist. She made massive contributions. Her work is not maybe so well known as the other people I've mentioned, um, especially not to the lay community, but within physics, her work uh, and the importance of her work cannot be overstated. And we'll be discussing, touching upon some of the important contributions that she made in the field of classical mechanics. Um, she also went on to do lots of other things. Uh, we won't touch upon that in this course. Okay, so roughly speaking, the kind of physics that we're going to talk about in this course is in this top row here. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, classical mechanics. This is not quantum mechanics. It's not on the nano scale, but we will allow things to move quickly and hence incorporate the effects of relativity. And by so doing, we will extend beyond Newton in the second half of this lecture series by incorporating the effects of special relativity, but it's still going to be classical mechanics in the sense uh, that we're not talking about quantum mechanics. H bar is equal to zero, if you like, in this lecture course. So there's this nice cartoon from XKCD. It plots the, uh, the kind of uh, interestingness, let's say, of various topics within physics against how many years of maths you need to understand them. And uh, actually, special relativity does uh, very well in this uh, graph. We see that it's extremely interesting and yet quite easy to understand. And uh, we will really see that even reading from Einstein's original papers, you can actually uh, really understand some of the concepts in a very, a very simple way. Uh, and yet the implications of those, of that theory and of his results are so deep and profound as to really change the way that we look at physical reality. So this course uh, does well for value for money, I think. OK, so let's talk about classical mechanics. What's new in this course? We're going to be talking about Newtonian mechanics, as I've emphasised, but it's going to be a generalised Newtonian mechanics. It's a systematic study of complex dynamical systems, and we're going to implement symmetries and constraints. We're going to do this within the Lagrangian formulation, and this is a powerful language to formulate fundamental physical laws and concepts. It involves generalised coordinates, and we'll see that this uh, really helps us to solve hard problems. This can also be extended to special and general relativity into quantum mechanics, quantum field theory, and so on. And perhaps that's the most important thing of all. The fact that when we put classical mechanics into this framework, we can actually generalize it to more complicated theories. And then there's special relativity in the second part of the course. This is relativity, as Galileo thought about it, but going beyond Galileo in the sense that we have no preferred reference frame for physics, but we add in this extra condition uh, that Einstein came up with, this, this idea of this speed limit, the constant speed of light. And furthermore, it applies to mechanical systems and also to non-mechanical systems, electromagnetic systems, actually all of physics. We'll have a look at the idea of in, uh, Lorentz invariance. This is a deeper symmetry of nature. We'll discuss this and understand where it comes from and what the consequences are. We'll talk about space-time and light cones, causality, and the breakdown of simultaneity, all of these very important concepts. And finally, we'll be doing um, all of this rigorously 
and we'll be introducing the mathematical formulation on which special relativity is based, the so-called four vectors. We'll be discussing the mass-energy-momentum relationships. We'll be discussing E equals mc squared. All of these things we'll derive from scratch in this course. To be able to undertake this course, please review your previous maths courses. You're going to need to know about linear algebra and vector calculus. You need to know about functions of several variables, derivatives, partial di differential equations, integration, and so on. So just remind yourselves of those things uh, so that you can follow along. In terms of the books, um, a lot of what we'll discuss will be contained in this famous uh, textbook by Goldstein, Classical Mechanics. Uh, this is a very good book covering both topics. Um, also more uh, especially related to special relativity. It's an old book, but I really like it. It's one by Wolfgang Rindler, Introduction to Special Relativity. It's a very nice book. Um, but there's plenty of books on this topic. This is really a canonical topic that is absolutely core to a lot of physics. And obviously there's been lots of books written about it. One on classical mechanics, uh, a famous one is by Taylor. There's another great one by Morin, another one by Kibble. You can look at general kind of physics books, like Fundamentals of Physics by Halliday, Resnick and Walker. It's a great book, um, but we really need to go way beyond that in this course. So if you do have that book and want to read the sections on classical mechanics and relativity in this book, feel free, but regard that as just a warm up. Um, in terms of uh, students at UCD taking the course PHYC 30020, um, it's important that when viewing these video lectures that you make your own notes on the material covered in these lectures. Uh, you can't expect to just watch a lecture passively and have all of the information sink in, so please make your own notes. In terms of the assessment, um, there is a continuous assessment part worth 20% of the final grade, and this will be broken down into five assignments roughly every two weeks. Uh, these will be pinned to the kind of material that are covered in the lectures, so it's important you keep up with the lectures each week. You should submit the answer, your, your solutions to these uh, assessments uh, electronically through Brightspace. They'll be graded and we'll have a tutorial to go through the solutions. The other 80% of the marks for the final grade come from the final exam, which this year um, will be done online again through Brightspace. The exam is synoptic in the sense that it covers all aspects of the course. Um, it will be uh, related to the content of the lectures that I'm giving here. Uh, there'll be nothing asked that isn't covered in the lectures. Uh, however, we're going to cover a lot of stuff. There are four questions, 25 marks each, uh, three hours in total this year. And uh, you have to answer all four of those questions. This is a core course and everything in it is core. So there's two questions on classical mechanics and two questions on special relativity. The pass mark is uh, rather low at 40%. I hope you all pass. Uh, if anyone fails, however, the reset may take the form of an oral exam, which the threat of which is usually enough to put people off and to study hard. Okay, so now let's get down to work. In the first part of the course, we'll be discussing classical mechanics, but before we start getting onto anything new, Let's remind ourselves of the old-fashioned way of doing things. This is Newtonian mechanics and Newton's laws. So of course you've already encountered Newton Newtonian mechanics before, and you've suffered through many a course on how to apply Newton's laws, uh, starting already in high school. So the idea is that you draw a little picture, and then on this uh, little picture we annotate all the various forces. For example, we have a mass of objects number one here, we'll call it M1. So there's a force acting on that downwards due to gravity, M1g. And then if the second one over here is M2, then we have a force due to gravity acting on this thing. And then correspondingly, we have uh, forces acting upwards, corresponding to the tension in this wire. And uh, balancing all of those forces, we work out the net force, and then using uh, Newton's second law, F equals MA, we can work out the acceleration, which we can then integrate to find the trajectories of the various particles. That's the basic idea. Similarly, if we have a pendulum here, we imagine that we have a force uh, due to the 
the, the gravity which acts uh, vertically downwards, but this time the tension in the wire that's holding this thing up is acting at an angle, and so we can decompose that into components. We can imagine a piece going horizontally and a piece going vertically. And of course, it's the vertical component of this tension force that has to balance the weight, mg, and then we have a horizontal component which drives the pendulum backwards and forwards. Again, we understand all of this in terms of Newton's laws. So our general strategy in Newtonian mechanics is, first of all, to draw a diagram. Secondly, we identify all of the various forces acting on the components and draw them onto the diagram. We then use vector addition on those various forces to work out the net forces on each of the particles. We use Newton's second law, F equals ma, to find the various accelerations. And finally, we integrate these equations up uh, to find the trajectories. So the central problem in classical mechanics is to really find the trajectory of particles or objects or interacting systems of particles. So what is the trajectory? The trajectory, which we'll denote r of t, uh, is a vectored quantity. What we mean by this is that in three-dimensional space, we can define the x component and the y component and the z component of the position of the particle. And this position in x, y, and z depends on time, t. And in Newtonian mechanics, at least, the time, t, is universal. It means it's common to everyone in all reference frames, in all coordinate systems. I am emphasizing the fact that the time is universal in Newt Newtonian mechanics because uh, later on in the course, when we study special relativity, we'll see that that's not actually the case, and time is a relative quantity that depends on your reference frame. But we're getting ahead of ourselves. Here we're just considering the physics according to Newton, and here we have a single time, common to all observers, and the trajectory is simply the position of the particle as a function of time. And armed with this trajectory, we can de uh, define a number of derived quantities. And the most obvious one is the velocity, which I'll denote v, vector, again, which will be a function of time. And this v is the time derivative of the position. What I mean by this thing r vector dot here, this dot is just a shorthand notation for the time derivative d by dt of the trajectory r of t. And if we expand that out in the vector notation, we can write that as dx by dt dy by dt, and dz by dt. Or put another way, just so we're all completely on the same page, we could refer to this as the x component of the velocity, the y component of the velocity, and the z component of the velocity, which we then assemble into this three-dimensional vector. That's the velocity. We can take another time derivative to obtain the acceleration. Which I will call a of t. Again, it's a vector. This a of t is the time derivative of v of t, which itself is the time derivative of r of t. And so a shorthand notation for this would be r double dot. So what I mean by this is it's d squared by dt squared, the second time derivative of the trajectory. And uh, again, I can write this out in the vector notation, d squared x 
by dt squared, d squared y by dt squared, and d squared z by dt squared. And those things are exactly the x, y, z components of the acceleration. And everything that I've written here is in Cartesian coordinates. So in the original definition of the trajectory here, this vector r of t is given in x, y, and z coordinates. So implicitly here, I was using Cartesian coordinates. And then when I took the time derivatives to obtain the velocity, Again, this was in Cartesian coordinates. I have the velocity in the x, y, and z directions. Likewise, with the acceleration, I have the acceleration in the x, y, and z directions. And uh, now we have the trajectory, the velocity, and the acceleration. We can actually derive some other kind of quantities, for example, the linear and the angular momentum. The linear momentum p is, again, a vector. It is related to the regular velocity v multiplied by the mass m. Notice here that the mass is a scalar quantity, not a vector, so we simply multiply numerically the component values of velocity by the numerical value of the mass. The angular momentum uh, L vector here, capital L vector, uh, actually, however, involves r cross p. It's the vector cross product of the position r and the linear momentum p. So this is a, a catalogue or a, a dictionary, of, if you like, of the different kind of objects that we're interested in in classical mechanics. And the fundamental question is, how do we find the trajectory r of t in the first place? If we knew the functional form of r of t, the trajectory, we can get everything else. So the question, of course, is how to find the trajectory r of t. And you know the answer? The answer is Newton's laws. The trajectory r of t depends on the force acting on the particle. How? Well, Newton gave us the answer. So let's look at Newton's three laws and recap. The first of Newton's laws um, is that the velocity will be a constant if and only if the force is equal to zero. This is the net force. So this is basically restating Galileo's principle of inertia, and it actually introduces the very concept of a force. A force is the thing that causes the velocity to change. And then we move on to Newton's second law. And we write this in a slightly more grown-up way now, that the force, which is a vectored quantity, is the time derivative of the momentum. It's dp by dt. And the momentum p here is, of course, also a vector. Using um, the dot notation, we can write f is equal to p dot. If the mass is a constant, this actually reduces to m times dv by dt, which is the acceleration, which is f equals ma. And again, let me emphasize, this is if the mass is constant. And in many cases, that's the case. But you could imagine other situations where it's not the case. Uh, for a, a classic example would be a rocket taking off where it's uh, burning and jettisoning fuel as it goes along and the mass of the rocket changes in time. So where does this equation come from? Where does Newton's second law come from? Well, it's basically the result of experiment and observation. Previously, physics was more of a kind of philosophical discipline in which people kind of tried to deduce the laws of nature uh, so by so-called pure reason. For example, Aristotle in uh, 350 BC or so suggested that the force is the mass times the velocity. You know, if you stop pushing it, it stops moving. It sounds intuitively correct, but it's not the result of actual experiments. Aristotle came up with that just because it sounded reasonable. But if you look carefully, you see that when you stop shoving an object, it doesn't stop straight away, uh, it decelerates. 
And of course, the deceleration is because there is a, a friction and a drag. That's a force and that's causing a, a deceleration. So really, um, it took a long time for people really to examine these situations properly uh, in what we would now refer to as the scientific method. Newton did that. He understood what was going on and he deduced his famous second law that the force is related to the acceleration and it is proportional to the acceleration furthermore and the proportionality constant he introduced as this thing the mass so this equation is like the defining equation relating the force to the acceleration it's basically an equation of motion and we'll see other formulations of these equations of motion uh, in this uh, course uh, but the grandfather of them all is Newton's second law. And this is the basic element of uh, classical mechanics, Newton's second law. It's the equation of motion, because if we have a given force F, we can find the acceleration, and then we can integrate it to find the trajectory. Now, what is not contained in Newton's second law is actually the law of the force, meaning in a given situation, what is the force? So to be able to use Newton's second law, we actually need to know the relevant force law. So for example, let's consider gravitation. Of course, this is the example considered by Newton himself. We imagine that we have two masses and they have a mutual attraction between them, F, which is related to the two masses, M1, and m2, let's call them, um, divided by the square of their distance, uh, the separation between them. Let me call that r12 uh, squared. And the proportionality constant between this object here on the right-hand side and the force is some constant called big G, which is the gravitational constant. Now we can turn this into a vector equation this is the force F um, on particle one due to particle two. And this, the, this vector here is in the uh, vector direction connecting the two particles R12. And this hat here on the top of this vector indicates uh, that it's a unit vector. It's something of unit length. So this is just an example. But the idea is that in a given context, uh, we need to know the law of the force. In this case, it's the law of gravitation. And then with this law of the force, uh, we can plug it into Newton's second law and we can work out the acceleration. Uh, and then we can integrate that all up to find the trajectory, which is the position of the particle as a function of time. And if we do that for, um, for example, a moon orbiting a planet, then we should be able to work out the orbit of the moon. That's something we'll do later in this course. So in this course, we're not going to be considering uh, the various force laws. We're going to take them as read. We're going to assume that we know the law of gravitation. We know the uh, electromagnetic forces. Uh, we know uh, the law of the force due to a spring. We know all of these things, we'll assume. What we're interested in here is, for a given force law, how can we use that to find out the dynamics and the mechanics of the, uh, of the system of particles. One auxiliary uh, but very important related quantity is the potential energy, which I've denoted here as a capital V. This is also something that depends on the position R. And uh, we can define a potential energy for a given force if it's a conservative force. And for a conservative force, um, the potential is related to the force through the gradient. So the force is minus the gradient of the potential. So here I'm using this notation for uh, the gradient here. It's a gradient operator, really. It's a vector, this, uh, this nabla sing symbol here. What it means is simply d by dx, d by dy, and d by dz. That's the expression 
in Cartesian coordinates. And notice here that I'm using the curly d's, meaning that they're partial derivatives with respect to x, y, and z. So what I have to do is I have a potential, which you'll note does not have a, uh, a vector arrow on the top here. This uh, potential is a scalar quantity. And, uh, but it does exist as a function of position r, um, which means x, y, z in space. And I can take the derivatives, therefore, with respect to x, y, z in space. And when I do that, and multiply by minus 1, I get the force. So this is the definition of the potential energy. This is the defining equation of the potential energy when you have a conservative force. And I'll talk a bit more later about what I mean by a conservative force. And this formulation, as I've written it, uh, works when the potential does not depend on the velocity. So here, the potential V of R does not depend on the velocity. Or the acceleration, of course. And there are forces which do depend on the velocity. For example, a friction force depends on the velocity. For example, the Lorentz magnetic force depends on velocity. So not all uh, forces uh, are conservative forces, and not all of them, therefore, can be expressed in this way in terms of a potential energy. Um, but in the cases where you do have a conservative force, um, we can write uh, Newton's second law in this alternative way, F equals ma becomes minus the gradient of the potential. Is equal to the mass times the acceleration. And the acceleration here I'll write as r double dot. So this is Newton's second law. for conservative forces. Written in terms of uh, the scalar potential energy. Now this equation, as I've written it, is a second order differential equation. And what that means is that, in general, the solution to this second-order differential equation has two integration constants. This might seem like uh, simply a technical mathematical thing, but it actually has physical meaning, as we'll see. Um, so what we need to do in order to actually specify the particular trajectory of our system, as opposed to uh, all possible general trajectories, we actually need to specify uh, initial conditions, and they basically pin down what these constants of integration are. And because we have two constants of integration, we need to provide two initial conditions. They could be um, the position at uh, two different times, or at t equals zero, they could be the position and the velocity. Once we've specified the initial position and velocity, Newton's second law allows us to determine the entire trajectory at any time. It's completely deterministic in this sense. The entire motion is fully determined if we just know the equation of motion and we know the initial conditions. So Newton's second law really establishes the equivalency between the force and the acceleration. Actually, Einstein went a bit further than this and really took the equal sign in F equals ma seriously. He said that forces were accelerations philosophically, not just numerically. It's not just that you multiply the numbers of m and a together and you get the number for f, but that the force really can be thought of as an acceleration. In particular, if we consider the force of gravity, this is something that is proportional to the mass. And if we look at Newton's second law, F equals ma, we see that the force is also proportional to the mass. So in this sense, 
the gravitational force can be literally thought of as an acceleration. For example, if you're in a lift that's moving up very, very rapidly, then you feel heavier. So the fact that you're in an accelerated frame of reference uh, feels actually to you like uh, a stronger force of gravity. Your weight has increased. Of course, that's not actually the case. It's simply the fact that um, the way in which you experience uh, a force due to gravity is the same as uh, the way you would experience a force just from being in an accelerated frame of reference. Uh, this is at the heart of the equivalence principle that underpins general relativity, and uh, we'll touch upon that later in this course. Okay, so let's finally look at Newton's third law. Newton's th third law is the law of action-reaction. We have that the force acting on particle one due to particle two is minus the force acting on particle two due to particle one. We have this re reciprocal nature of these forces. And of course, it's important here, as you will know, uh, that these forces are of the same type. And this is an important point. So often people consider Newton's third law pairs um, of, uh, of forces, but they're not of the same type, and therefore they can't actually be compared in this way. By the same type, for example, I mean, let's say you have two masses and you're looking at the mutual gravitational attraction between them. The gravitational force on one of them due to the other particle is the same as the gravitational force uh, on that other particle due to the first one, uh, barring this minus sign. Uh, those are the same type of forces, they're both gravitational forces, and they form this Newton's third law pair. However, what's expressed in this equation, uh, noting that these objects, these forces here are vectored objects, is the so-called weak form of Newton's third law. Imagine that I have two massive particles, one and two, um, let me consider the forces on these things. Uh, I could imagine a force like this, which is F12. It's the force on particle 1 due to particle 2, and a complementary force acting on particle 2 due to particle 1, which is F21. Now, these two vectors do satisfy F12 is equal to minus f21 uh, because they're vectors and they're pointing in opposite directions. However, those forces are not directed along the vector connecting the two objects. So there is a strong form of Newton's third law which says that not only does f12 have to equal minus f21, but the directions of those forces must be directed you know, towards each other along the line of centers of the two objects. So here, for example, we have the strong form of Newton's third law, which says that we have two particles, F12 and F21. Uh, they obey F12 is equal to minus F21, and also they're directed along the same line, connecting the line of centres. So how would we encapsulate that in mathematical form? How do we express the strong form of Newton's third law mathematically? Well, we write it in this way. We have to have some information here about the positions of the particles. Let's say we have two particles, i and j. We look at the relative vector separating the two objects, ri minus rj. We can take the cross product of that with the force, fij. And that object should be equal to zero. And this condition here basically forces the uh, two forces, F12 and F21, uh, to be parallel to the line of centers connecting the two particles. Implicitly with all of this, we also have a superposition law for forces. And what that basically means is that the total force acting on a given particle I, which is a vector, can be simply obtained by the vector sum of all of the individual forces acting upon that particle, F, all of the individual Fij's. 
from all of the other particles j. We just have to remember here that this is vector addition to find the total net force on particle i. And then with this total net force on particle i, we can use Newton's second law, f equals ma, to work out the acceleration of particle i, and then we can integrate it up to find the trajectory of particle i. So now let's look at some conservation laws appearing in classical mechanics, and especially those ones implied directly by Newton's equations. First of all, what do we mean by a conservation law? What is a conserved quantity? A physical quantity is conserved if it has no time dependence. That means the value of this observable quantity is the same, it's constant, independent of the time, and therefore the dynamics of the system doesn't affect the value of this observable. It's something that's conserved. Let's take a look at an important example, which we can actually already read off from Newton's second law. We know that the force is equal to the rate of change of the momentum, or uh, p dot. So if no forces act, then f equals naught, then this implies by Newton's second law that p dot is equal to zero. So what does p dot equals to zero mean? Well, literally, it means dp by dt is equal to zero. And this is a differential equation. It's a rather simple one, but it is a differential equation. And we can integrate it up to find that p is equal to a constant. This constant is the constant of integration uh, when we integrate up dp by dt is equal to zero. So basically, the value of the momentum p is set by the initial conditions, uh, the boundary conditions, if you like, of our uh, differential equation, and then it remains fixed and pinned to that constant independent of time. This object is therefore constant, it is conserved. If no net forces act, then linear momentum is conserved. Actually, there's even more we can say, because the equation f equals p dot is a vector equation, and that means that we can apply this condition for each component of the force, each component of the momentum. So, in particular, we learn that if uh, fx is equal to zero, the x component of the force, then px is constant. The momentum, the linear momentum along the x direction is conserved. So this idea of the conservation of momentum actually holds component by component I could imagine a force acting along the y direction, and still my momentum along the x direction would be conserved. Let's now look at another example of angular momentum. Let's recall that the angular momentum L is given by R cross P, the vector cross products of the position and the linear momentum. Let's also introduce the concept of a torque, denoted n, which is going to be r cross f, the vector cross product of the position with the force. So this quantity, the torque, r cross f, can of course be written from Newton's second law as r cross p dot. And that's because f is equal to p dot from Newton's second law. And therefore, uh, we can actually express this torque in a slightly clever way. Let's write it out in this fashion as d by dt of r cross p minus d by dt of r cross p. So here the position of the brackets is important. So let's see why I can write it in that fashion. Consider this first term here. We have d by dt of r cross p, and uh, I have two quantities here, r and p, which both depend on time. And therefore, if I'm going to take the time derivative of it, I need to use the chain rule. And when I use the chain rule on this, I'm going to get two terms. I get one term, dr by dt cross p, 
and I get another term, r cross dp by dt. And so what I actually want is r cross p dot, that's this term here. What I don't want is this other term that I get from doing chain rule. But this term is precisely this one which I subtract off. So indeed it is correct that the torque can be expressed in terms of uh, this pair of objects here. This might look like it's more complicated than what we started with, but actually it's not, because what is uh, d by dt of r? That is, of course, the velocity v. And what is p? This is simply mass times velocity. And we're taking the cross product here of v, uh, the velocity times m times v, the mass is just a scalar, so I'm taking the cross product of the vector with itself. The vector and itself are, of course, parallel, and therefore the cross product gives zero. So the nice thing about splitting it up like this is actually this second term is equal to zero. And that's simply in the end because the velocity is parallel to the momentum. Okay, we know that that should be the case. Okay, so let's return to the first term, r cross p. Well, that is exactly the angular momentum L. And so all of this was a very roundabout way of deriving the following important result, that the torque can be expressed as L dot, the rate of change of the angular momentum. So this is kind of like Newton's second law, but for angular momentum. Newton's second law says that F is equal to P dot, uh, but that also implies that n is equal to L dot. The torque is equal to the rate of change of the angular momentum. So the torque is playing the role of the force in this, uh, in this uh, angular system. And this implies another conservation law. In particular, if there is no torque acting, if n is equal to zero, then that implies L dot is equal to zero, and therefore L is a constant. If no torques act, it means that the angular momentum is conserved. Angular momentum is conserved if no torque acts. And again, as with the linear momentum, this is a vector equation here. n is equal to uh, L dot. And what that means is that it applies component by component. So again, if nx is equal to zero, then Lx is conserved. Another kind of conservation law that's very important that we're going to have to consider is the conservation of energy. And the way we do this is by thinking about the work done by a force. Imagine that we have some particle and it's at position one. And over some amount of time, the particle moves to position two. So it takes some particular path and then ends up at position two here. What is the work done by a force uh, along the path from one to two. Let's denote this work done uh, from one to two by w, one, two. This is equal to the line integral of the force dot ds. And the integral is along the path from one to two. So the start and end point uh, are from one to two. And this is a line integral along the path. So this really depends on the path taken. Uh, what is this ds here? This ds is the infinitesimal displacement vector. It's an object uh, which is a vector and it points along uh, the path at each instant along the path. So ds vector is actually a vector dx, dy, dz along the path. So if I take a little bit of the path, for example, here, then ds is precisely 
this vector that points along that part of the path. I can also write this ds if I want as v times dt. And that re-emphasizes the point that um, the, uh, the, the vector ds is always pointing along the path because the particle is moving along and its direction at any one point is in the direction of the velocity v. So the direction of ds is the direction of the velocity v. So how do I know that ds is equal to v dt? Well, it's very simple. It's because that v is itself a vector dx by dt, dy by dt, dz by dt. And if I multiply each component by dt, I'm just going to be ended up with uh, dx, dy, dz. And as advertised, that is the infinitesimal displacement vector ds. So there we have it. The infinitesimal displacement vector is something that points instantaneously along the direction of the path. Um, and a particle can move along at a velocity v, and at every point along the path, ds is directed along the, uh, along the velocity which is the direction of the particle. Okay, so let's now consider the case of a constant mass particle. We have F equals MA in that case. And so let's just substitute in F equals MA into our equa equation for the work. I have the work W12 is equal to the integral along the path from start to end, from 1 to 2, of uh, the mass, which I can take out of the integral because that's constant, and then the acceleration dotted into ds, the vector dot product here. So what does this mean? Well, I can express the acceleration in terms of the time derivative of the velocity. and write that as dv by dt and I can write that as the integral dv by dt dotted now not into ds but rather into uh, v dt okay this seems like a bit of gratuitous uh, algebraic manipulation here, but it's actually rather handy to write it in this form. If I look at the integrand here, I have uh, dv by dt dot v. And a moment's thought will tell you that I can actually write this in a slightly simplified fashion. Let's take out a factor of a half and write the integrand as d by dt of v squared dt. How was I able to do that? Well, let's look at what this integrand here is, d by dt of v squared. Uh, I can easily differentiate that. How do I do it? I bring the power down to the front, so that gives me 2. Uh, I reduce the power by 1, that gives me a factor of v. And then I take the derivative, dv by dt. So the factor of 2 cancels this factor of a half. I get a factor of v, which is this v, and then I get um, a factor here of dv by dt, which is this factor. So actually, these two expressions are identical. And the nice thing about it, written in this form, is I've got a, uh, an integral of an integrand that has a d by dt in it. So these dt's kind of cancel out in some sense. Uh, if we're being a bit more careful about that, what we'd see is that we pick up a value of v squared at the starting point, evaluated at point 1, and the v factor of v squared evaluated at the end point, evaluated at uh, point 2. And so our final result is that w12 is 1 half of m times the velocity squared at the end point minus velocity squared at the start point. And this leads to a very important expression that the work done along the path from 1 to 2
is the difference in the kinetic energy T2 minus T1, where Ti, let's call it, is the kinetic energy Um, which is a half m v i squared at a given point along the path i. So the work done by a force uh, along a path from 1 to 2 is just the difference in the kinetic energy between the start and end points. Now, forces can either be conservative or non-conservative, So what does that mean? So first of all, if we have a conservative force, what it means is that no mechanical energy is lost or destroyed or dissipated. The work done is therefore independent of the path taken from the start to the end point. It doesn't depend on the details of how the particle gets from one point to another if there is no uh, energy that's lost or dissipated. The work done is simply the change in the kinetic energy, and that doesn't depend on the path you take. And examples of conservative forces like this would be uh, gravitation, electrostatics, uh, Hooke's law, for example, uh, relating to springs. And, uh, of course, there are many more. On the other hand, we have non-conservative forces. And these are situations where mechanical energy is dissipated by the force. So the work does actually depend on the path taken. A classic example of this would be friction. And, of course, you know that friction is a non-conservative force because the work does depend on the path taken. Imagine I have a heavy object uh, on a table and I want to move it along the table from point A to point B. Um, there will be some friction between the object and the table, and as I shove this object along the table, uh, some energy will be dissipated uh, through this friction force. And the amount of energy depends on the path I take. If I shove the part, if I shove this object in a very roundabout way from side to side on the table, uh, and then eventually get to its destination, I will use up more energy than if I push it along the shortest route. Also, if I shove it very quickly, the velocity is larger, and the friction force depends on the velocity, and therefore, again, it depends on how I get the particle from point A to point B, as to how much energy is dissipated and therefore what the work done by the force is. So friction would be a classic example of a non-conservative force where energy is dissipated and the work depends on the path you take to get the particle from A to B. There are other, maybe less obvious uh, examples. Magnetism. This is the uh, magnetic part of the electromagnetic Lorentz force is a force that depends on the velocity, and therefore is in this sense non-conservative. And indeed, if you have any kind of time-dependent potentials at all, these would be classed as non-conservative. In general, if a force depends on the velocity, uh, then it's non-conservative. However, it turns out that all fundamental forces are actually conservative. And so now on, we're only going to consider these kinds of conservative forces. OK, so why is that? Newton's laws uh, work for conservative forces and for non-conservative forces. They work for any force. But on the microscopic level, on the deepest level of physics, you know that there are no such thing as non-conservative forces. Forces between microscopic parts are fundamental forces, and these are always conservative.
Non-conservative forces, such as friction, only appear because we neglect microscopic complications or we neglect certain degrees of freedom in our system. Energy is only lost from our system if we take a very narrow and restricted view of what the system is. If we widen our definition of the system to include the environment, then the energy is not lost. It is simply moved from one place to the other. It's moved from one form of energy into another. If we really zoom in and look at the, the microscopic scale, uh, no energy is ever lost. It's just moved around. No, when we talk about energy being dissipated, that's because we have an artificial separation of system and environment. If we take the broader view, then indeed forces are always conservative forces. So let's just focus on those conservative forces from now on. All the fundamental laws can be cast in terms of these conservative forces. So what are the consequences of the path independence of work done by a conservative force? And how can we encapsulate this mathematically in an equation? Well, we'll see that the implication is the existence of something called a scalar potential. Um, in terms of conservative forces, the scalar potential is actually the potential energy. We'll get onto that. So how do we see this? Let's start again from our definition of the work done by a force. It's the line integral over some path of the force integrated over that line, over the path taken, which means f dot ds, ds being, again, the infinitesimal displacement vector along that path. Um, now let's consider making a closed loop So the path I'm taking is going to start off at a, a particular point. It's going to go off into space, move around a bit, but then return back to the same point in space. So the work done, if it's a conservative force along a closed loop, must be equal to zero. Why is that? Because the work done by a conservative force is the difference in the kinetic energies. And if there's no full energy dissipated, then the kinetic energies at the start and the end are going to be equal. The path independence uh, means that the result can only depend on the start and end points. And if the start and end points are the same, then obviously the work done has to vanish. So this is an important result. If we have a closed loop, the work done by conservative force is equal to zero. What can we do with that interesting result? Well, we can use... Um, a result from vector calculus called Stokes' theorem. And Stokes' theorem um, tells us that we can rewrite this line integral, this closed loop line integral, in a different way. We can write it as the curl of the force integrated over the surface of a bounded region. So this dA here is the integral over the surface of some region. And that's the left-hand side. The right-hand side is still equal to zero. So this is just application of Stokes' theorem here. You might remember it from vector calculus. Um, if not, then you can just take my word for it here. I can write the line integral of f dot ds in terms of the area integral of the curl of f. And what is this area integral? Well, it is the area bounded by the original loop. What I can then do is shrink that loop down to zero. This result holds for any loop, and I can make that loop go to very, very, very small values. Or put it another way, if this result doesn't depend on the loop, then it must mean that the integrand itself is equal to zero. That's the only way that this, th this integral can be equal to zero for any loop, is if the integrand itself is equal to zero. And so I can write that the curl of f must be something that's equal to zero. Conservative forces, therefore, have no curl. This is a very strong constraint. Remember what this gradient operator, this Nabla symbol here, means. It means it's a vector which it comprises elements d by dx, d by dy, d by dz. So if I take the vector cross product of 
uh, of this Nabla thing with f and set that equal to zero, because it's a vector equation, I actually have three constraint equations from here. And that's important, and it's information that we can utilize. So let me just write out those equations. So in the original vector notation, I have a force f with components x, y, z, and I have derivatives dx, dy, dz. On the right-hand side, I have zero, but it's a zero vector, meaning that every component of the vector is separately equal to zero. So let's unpack this cross product. I can, of course, write this cross product in terms of the determinant, where on the top row here, I have the unit vectors along the x, y, and z directions. I denote those as x hat, y hat, and z hat. In the middle row, I have the first of the vectors, which is uh, a vector comprising components dx, uh, d by dx, d by dy, and d by dz. And on the bottom row of this determinant, I have the second vector, which has components of the force fx, fy, and fz. So I just go ahead and I work out uh, the, uh, the elements of this, uh, this determinant, and I find the following. I have these three equations for the three components of the vectors, and these are the constraint equations. You see that the fact that conservative forces have no curl puts stringent constraints on the type of force that it can be. In particular, the derivatives of the force are constrained in these following ways. For example, if I take this first one, I see that uh, the y component of the force differentiated along the z component, the z direction, has to be equal to the z component of the force differentiated upon along the y direction. That's a non-trivial result. There are many types of uh, forces you can imagine which would not satisfy this kind of constraint. And of course, we have another two constraint equations as well. So all of this is to say that if we have a conservative force, um, the nature of that force is, is special. It's constrained by these, uh, that, that, by these equations. That's a mathematical statement. Is there a way that we can utilize this information contained in these constraint equations to help us out in doing our mechanics? And the answer is uh, yes, we can introduce this thing called a scalar potential that automatically takes into account these constraints. How does that work? So let's define something called a potential, V of R, which is a scalar, not a vector. And it's defined such that the force is equal to minus the gradient of this potential. Why would we want to do that? And why does that help us? Well, let's just substitute in this definition of the force in terms of the scalar potential into our equation for the, uh, the curl of the force being equal to zero. For a conservative force, I know that the curl is equal to zero. So let's just substitute this expression in, and I'll have that the curl of the gradient of the potential is equal to zero. And actually, that is automatically true, independent of whatever potential I have. And the reason is that in here, I have the curl of the gradient And by the magic of mathematics, the curl of the gradient of any scalar field, V, is always equal to zero automatically. This has nothing to do with physics. It's nothing to do with uh, special types of forces or different types of potentials and so on. This is simply a mathematical identity that the curl of the gradient of a scalar field is equal to zero. So what have we achieved here? By introducing a potential and writing the force as the gradient of the potential, we can automatically take into account the constraints that that force has zero curl. And this is very neat because what we can now do is rewrite all of our equations in terms of a scalar potential V. And this is much easier to work with because it's not a vector. We don't have to worry about taking dot and cross products. We don't have to worry about doing vector addition the potential is just a simple numerical number at every point in space, and uh, it's much, much easier to deal with in practice, as we will see.
Let me provide some examples of this now. Let's have a look at the example of gravitation. There we have um, a force, which is G M1 M2 over R squared. And I can define a, uh, I can define a gravitational potential relating to this, which is simply minus G of M1 M2 over R such that if I take minus the gradient of this potential, I obtain the force. It's exactly analogous in electrostatics, where I have an electrostatic force which depends on the charges q1, q2 over 4 pi epsilon naught r squared, and then there's a corresponding uh, electric potential, which is simply minus G, uh, Q1, Q2 over 4 pi epsilon naught r. Of course, there are also non-conservative forces, for example, friction and the magnetic part of the Lorentz force. And both of these are non-conservative, and they both depend, as you can see, on velocity here. And what that means is that we cannot define a scalar potential for, the, for these forces. Let me say I cannot define a scalar potential energy. When you come on to studying electromagnetism in greater detail, we'll see that, in fact, there is a way of expressing uh, electromagnetic forces uh, in terms of potentials, uh, but this is not quite the same here as a simple scalar potential energy, per se. And, of course, the reason why we can't define a scalar potential energy for these non-conservative forces is that uh, the work done by these forces depends on the path taken. OK, so what's the relation between this object that we've just defined, this thing we called the scalar potential, and the potential energy, the thing that we usually associate uh, with a potential? Well, let's explore that now. First of all, notice that the potential that we've just defined, this scalar potential, is actually only defined up to a constant. Uh, what do I mean by that, and why, why is that? Well, let's return to our definition of the force in terms of minus the gradient of the potential. Um, imagine now that we replace the potential, we, we define something, let's call it V tilde of R, which is going to be the old potential, V of R, plus some constant, V naught. This V naught does not depend on position. That's important. It's literally a constant that is added everywhere in space for all r. And um, therefore, what we see is that the force is the same using either v or v tilde, since the gradient of v naught is equal to zero. So because we've defined the force through the gradient of the potential, I can add any constant to that potential I like, and it still gives me the same force. And that's because the gradient of this constant is, of course, equal to zero. The, the derivative of constants is equal to, to zero. So we have the same force, and therefore, through Newton's second law, the same physics for different potentials that are related to each other by constants. And this is a trivial example of something called a gauge transformation. What this means is that physical quantities, for example, the energy, uh, cannot depend on this added constant, V naught. So this implies that the energy can only depend on differences in the potential. The value of the potential evaluated at one point subtracted from the value of the potential evaluated at a different point. Because in that scenario, of course, the constant that we added on, v naught, will cancel. So let's see how that works in practice. 
Let's go back to our expression for the work done moving a particle from position 1 to position 2 due to some force. It's the line integral along the path from start point 1 to end point 2 of the force f dot ds. Let's now replace f by a minus gradient of the potential v and see what happens. I can write this as minus the integral, again along the path, of the gradient of the potential v dot ds. ds is the integral along the line, of course. And in a very similar way as before, this can be written now as the value of the potential at 1 minus the value of the potential at 2. Why is that? Well, let's maybe just have a quick look at the one-dimensional version where it's a bit simpler. In the one-dimensional version, what I have here is minus the integral from, let's say, a position x1 to a position x2 of the gradient, but in 1D, the gradient is just d by dx. And then we have a potential v, and uh, we're integrating along the line x in one dimension, so it's just dx. And this is exactly the same thing as we had before. Um, I ha I'm integrating a derivative. And therefore, this just gives me uh, the value of v evaluated at x2 minus the value of v evaluated at x1. And then that overall minus sign swaps those around, and I end up with v1 minus v2. So this is rather interesting because what we've obtained here is an alternative expression for the work done in terms of the potential. In particular, what we see is that the work done moving a particle from 1 to under a conservative force, can either be expressed as the difference in the kinetic energies that we saw earlier, or the difference in the potential energies that we see uh, on this slide. And in particular, if I just manipulate this expression a bit, I end up with the final result, which is extremely important, which embodies the conservation of energy, namely, that the sum of v1 plus t1 is equal to the sum of v2 plus t2. This tells us that the total energy, the kinetic energy plus the potential energy at the beginning of the journey, at point 1, is equal to the total energy, kinetic plus potential, at the end of the journey, at point 2. So in the end, what we see is the total energy, E, is the sum of the kinetic energy plus the potential energy. And this object is constant. It doesn't change. It is a conserved quantity. So that's the punchline. The energy is conserved. And what I've derived here is quite straightforwardly generalized to multiple particles. And although the physics of more complex systems is still given by Newton's laws in principle, in practice, it can be very cumbersome and complicated to solve these kind of problems. So what I want to do now to finish this lecture is to do a very simple example of Newtonian physics, uh, and we'll see how things can get quite complicated very quickly, and how some more generalised framework for treating more complicated problems is required and the rest of the course will be devoted to exploring this new framework and this new formalism for uh, solving these kind of problems. So let's look at some examples of the Newtonian formulation. The first example is going to be Newton's second law in plane polar coordinates in two dimensions. Um, so what we're going to do is consider a single particle in some potential v. So I first of all want to describe my position vector r in Cartesian coordinates, it's just in 2D, so I have x and y Cartesian coordinates. And let's now switch to these advertised plane polar coordinates. And I do this by considering that the particle is located somewhere in space, let's put it here, and 
I can define the position of that particle in terms of an x-coordinate and a y-coordinate, but I can also define it in terms of a radial extent from the origin r and an angle to the x-axis theta, such that x is r cos theta and y is r sine theta. And what I can do here <coughs> is define the uh, position vector r in terms of this length r. The ra this is actually literally the radial extent of the uh, particle from the origin. In which direction? Well, it's in the r hat direction. What is this r hat? Well, it's obvious from here, therefore, that the r hat direction is itself cos theta, and sine theta is a vector. Good. And that's just got by comparing this expression here for the r vector to this expression for the r vector and substituting in these objects. And likewise, um, we will actually come back to this, but likewise I can define in plane polar coordinates a unit vector along the theta direction. This is something that should be uh, of unit length and orthogonal to r hat at every point, and it's perhaps easy to convince yourself that this should be minus sine theta and cos theta as a unit vector. Okay, good. So let's take a particle um, in our two-dimensional space and look at Newton's second law. Newton's second law in the Cartesian coordinates. What does it look like? Um, I have two of them, one in the x direction and one in the y direction. Let's write them out. I have mx double dot is equal to minus dv by dx. The v here is the potential, not to be confused with the velocity, of course. So that is Newton's second law in potential form along the x direction. Likewise, along the y direction, my double dot is minus dv by dy. It's very simple. What about converting this into polar coordinates now? What happens if I want to describe this motion in terms of r and theta rather than x and y? How do I do it? One guess might be that the equation of motion is mr double dot is equal to minus dv by dr, and m theta double dot is minus dv by d theta. That is not correct, and that is at the heart of all the trouble with Newtonian mechanics. It's very difficult to switch coordinate systems um, to anything that's not completely trivial. Even switching to plane polar coordinates is a bit of a mess, as we will see. And uh, the reason why it's a mess is because we have to take into account centrifugal pseudo-forces. Uh, and we'll see exactly how and why that comes about uh, right now. So on the last slide, I wrote that the position vector r can be written as the radial extent r times r hat. Now, what about r dot, the velocity, r vector dot? Is it just r dot in the r hat direction? And the answer is definitely not. And the reason for that is that r hat is actually not constant. r hat is something that points in a particular direction, and it depends on where the particle is as to what the r hat uh, direction actually is. So let's actually show what that is in actual detail. Let's start with dr hat by dt. Here, we can write this um, by chain rule is dr hat by d theta times d theta by dt. Why do we want to do this? That's because um, we actually can calculate 
the derivative d r hat, dr hat by d theta because we have an expression for r hat. It's cos theta. It's the vector cos theta sine theta. So I can take easily the derivative dr hat by d theta, and d theta by dt is just theta dot. And so overall, this thing is equal to the vector minus sine theta cos theta times theta dot. If I take the derivative of r hat there, and this actually, from the previous definition, if you recall, I also have theta hat is minus sine theta and cos theta. It turns out that dr hat by dt is actually theta dot times theta hat. It's in the theta hat direction, and its uh, amplitude is theta dot, the, the angular velocity theta dot. Okay, so it's not actually as simple as you might have thought, what about d theta hat by dt? Well, I can play the same game. I can write d theta hat by dt as d theta hat by d theta. d theta by dt, that's just chain rule. And that's going to give me, if I do the, uh, if I do the differentiation there, minus cos theta minus sine theta, which gives me minus theta dot r hat. So this is rather counterintuitive. You take the time derivative of r hat, you get something proportional to theta hat. You take the time derivative of theta hat, you get something proportional to r hat. So this is part of the problem uh, that we see when we're converting dynamical problems into uh, polar coordinates. Okay, but we're not even there yet, because what we actually want is um, to understand Newton's second law, which means we need the um, not just the position, but also the velocity and eventually the uh, acceleration. So the velocity is d by dt of the r vector, which is d by dt of r r hat. And we can use product rule on this, and that gives us um, two factors, d by dt of r times r hat plus r d by dt of r hat. And we've just gone to lengths to work out d by dt of r hat. That was the purpose of doing this. Overall, we get r dot r hat plus, substituting in here, r theta dot theta hat. Okay, so that's a little bit messy. And that's only the velocity. What we need for Newton's second law is the acceleration. That is r double dot, which is another factor, d by dt, of the thing we've just worked out, of r dot. And we have to now do several product rules on this. Let me just write them all out. It's going to be d by dt of r dot times r hat plus r dot d by dt of r hat. They're the two terms arising from product rule of this thing. Then I'm going to get three terms coming from this thing. Let's just be systematic. It's d by dt of r multiplied by theta dot theta hat plus r d by dt of theta dot theta hat and finally r theta dot d by dt of theta hat. And it's that last term, d by dt of theta hat, that we worked out on this line. Okay. So I can substitute in all of the bits and pieces there and come up with a final result for the acceleration r vector double dot. And it's not that pleasant. It looks like this. And this is after collecting the terms and simplifying it a little bit. We get a term along the r hat direction, 
in plain polar coordinates. And we get a term along the theta hat direction. Um, so there we have it. Um, this is a rather complicated expression um, for the acceleration of a particle in polar coordinates. You see, we haven't actually done any mechanics yet. We're simply changing the coordinate system um, from Cartesian coordinates to plane polar coordinates. And you can already see that the acceleration takes this unpleasant form. Newton's second law involves uh, the acceleration of the particle r vector double dot, but it also involves the gradient of the potential. And so what we also need to know is what the gradient operator looks like in polar coordinates. Now, I won't bother writing that out again um, and deriving it, but let me just quote the final result. And here we have the ex final expression for the gradient operator in plane polar coordinates. So all of this is starting to look a bit alarming. Let's put it together and actually work out um, Newton's second law for a particle moving uh, in plane polar coordinates. So Newton's second law in plane polars, f equals ma, what we really mean is minus the gradient of v, the potential, is equal to the mass times r vector double dot, the acceleration. So let's just put this together now in plane polar coordinates and look along the r direction, the r hat direction. Um, we have minus dv by dr on the left is equal to mr double dot, looking good so far. But then we get an extra term, minus mr theta dot squared. And if we look along the theta hat direction, we have minus 1 over r dv by d theta. That's coming from the different expression for the gradient operator in plane polars. And on the right hand side, we have 2mr dot theta dot plus mr dot theta double dot. So these expressions are not what you'd expect. They're not intuitive. You can't guess them. You have to really go through all of this horrific maths. And um, in particular, it's hard to identify the source of these different terms and what they mean. You might have naively expected that when you convert Newton's second law to plane polars, you get a term like this, but actually you get this extra term and this thing is the centrifugal force. It's not a real force. It's because we're in a non-inertial reference frame. It's because if we say that this theta dot here is, you know, we sometimes we can call that an angular velocity omega, this term mr theta dot squared just means mr omega squared, which sometimes is written mv squared upon r. This is the usual centrifugal force. This is kind of a pseudo force. It's not a real force. It's something that comes out from the choice of the coordinate system. And then we have the second equation along the theta hat direction. And uh, this is very complicated. There's no way you could just guess this without really working it out. Furthermore, note that if the acceleration, the actual acceleration, r vector double dot was equal to zero, that does not imply that r double dot is equal to zero or theta double dot is equal to zero. These things can actually cancel out in these exp expressions and still yield an overall acceleration uh, equals to zero. So the punchline is there is no generalized Newton's equation of motion which reads something like this. M Q, let's call it double dot, equals F Q. So there's no such Newton equation of motion for a generalized coordinate Q.
that Newton's equations of motion F equals MA work in Cartesian coordinates only. And what we see from this is if we switch to any other kind of coordinate system other than Cartesian coordinates, they're non-inertial coordinates in the sense that you get these apparent pseudo forces like centrifugal forces. So all of that uh, illustrates the complications when you go from Cartesian coordinates to curvilinear coordinates. Um, let me do another example, uh, which is a very common situation. Um, let's stay with Cartesian coordinates, but consider an accelerated reference frame in particular, let's consider a, a rotating reference frame. So let's say our original coordinates are, uh, we have an R vector. We'll just look at two dimensions again. So in Cartesian coordinates, uh, we have X and Y. Um, Newton's second law takes the nice form in Cartesian coordinates uh, that I've written down here. Let's now go to some new coordinates. Let's say that r primed is equal to our old r plus for example, some velocity v r times t. Now, if this velocity v r that I've written down here is a constant, then obviously the acceleration r double dot primed is equal to the acceleration r double dot. Because when I take the time derivative of this expression uh, relating r primes to r, I will pick up um, a factor of the velocity vr. And then if I take another derivative, and if vr is constant, that term will drop out. OK, what that means is if I just substitute that in to my um, Newton's second law equation, then uh, I obtain the following. I get minus the gradient of v. The v is now, the, this is the potential v. This is evaluated at a position r, which means r primed minus v r of t. On the right hand side, I have m r double dot primed. So I am indeed able to convert this into uh, a nice form in the primed coordinates. Now, on the left hand side, it's a bit weird um, because I have a time dependent potential. The potential is being evaluated at a position which actually depends on the time. And that's because I've switched reference frames. I've changed from a static reference frame to a moving reference frame. And if I have a moving reference frame, the background potential is the thing that looks to be moving. OK, that's fine. Um, but what if the velocity vr is not constant? What happens if vr is not constant? In that case, Newton's second law has the same expression on the left-hand side. On the right-hand side, I get the same term, mr double dot primed, but I get a new term as well, which is m times vr dot. I get something that involves the time derivative of the velocity there. And this is exactly this kind of pseudo-force that we were talking about previously. 
If I have um, an accelerated reference frame, meaning that the velocity in here is not a constant velocity, then my Newton's equation of motion picks up this extra term. And if you just see the way this uh, appears, I have m times r prime double dot minus m times v vector dot. This second term appears like a force, uh, but there's no real force in there. It's just because we have an accelerated reference frame, and that's why we refer to that thing as a pseudo force. So let's do a concrete example of something in a rotating reference frame. So this is very common. You can imagine the situation where um, I'm st standing on the ground and I have a coordinate system uh, X and Y describing the positions of objects relative to me. But then I can climb on board a merry-go-round, which is spinning around, and I want to adopt this rotating frame of reference. A static object on the ground will then appear to be whirling around me, and I want to convert to this new frame of reference. How do I do that? So I can convert my original coordinates into my new coordinates with the primed, uh, in the primed reference frame. And the way I convert from the original to the new ones uh, is through this matrix product here involving um, a rotation angle and a rotation uh, which is omega t and a, uh, an angular velocity which is omega there. So in the original coordinates we have a system which is inertial. In the new coordinates we have a non-inertial system. And it's non-inertial in the sense that we get these additional pseudo forces. In particular, if the actual acceleration of a particle in the original frame of reference is equal to zero, this still gives in the rotated frame or the rotating frame uh, a finite acceleration. So a finite acceleration means that there's an apparent force, and that is exactly this pseudo force. So in a rotating frame, things appear to be accelerating under mysterious and fictitious forces. These are not real forces, they're just because we're in a rotating frame. So if I'm sitting on the merry-go-round, it looks like static objects are uh, accelerating, moving around in circles, and to get an object to move around uh, in circles and accelerate, you would imagine that you'd need to apply a force by Newton's second law. An example of this, uh, a very famous example, is the, is the Coriolis force that affects the weather on Earth. And that's because the Earth is, of course, itself rotating. The Earth is therefore a non-inertial reference frame, and we observe these uh, pseudo-forces. These pseudo-forces are called Coriolis forces, in this context, and they cause these circulating wind currents. Okay, so we want to be able to understand complicated problems. We want to be able to go to arbitrary coordinate systems, whether inertial or not. We want to be able to go to accelerated reference frames. We want to look at a rich range of hard problems in mechanics. And as we've seen already, even by these very simple examples, it gets quick, it very quickly becomes difficult um, when you're using the standard machinery of Newtonian mechanics. The physics is all in there, but it ends up being difficult to solve. So what we want to do in the rest of this course, starting from the next lecture, is to develop a new formalism based on Lagrangian mechanics, and we'll see that this is a much simpler and more powerful way of solving the problems. The point of Lagrangian mechanics, as opposed to Newtonian mechanics, um, is to make things simpler, not harder. It allows us to tackle more complicated problems because the formalism itself is simpler. But to get there, we need to do a little bit of work and understand uh, something deeper about what's going on in classical mechanics. And that's the content of the next lecture.